This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Every couple of years, the animation fandom gets in this strange pattern, where they'll drudge up some random CGI cartoon from over a decade ago that nobody cares about anymore, finds memeable clips from it they can share on Twitter. The memes build this giant ironic fan bias before they overdo it so much and start to unironically like the show. And that's when we start getting those statements like, Am I the only one who thinks this cartoon is actually underrated? Yes. Yes, you are. Right now, the one we're experiencing this with is, funnily enough, The Garfield Show, which I talked about a few weeks back. It started with some awful-sounding villain song, and suddenly people have convinced themselves this show is anything but incredibly weird and boring. Genuinely saw people comparing this to We Are Number One, like, no, the difference is that song was actually catchy. This is just... Folks believe and perceive I am an abomination. Yeah, no. All of this reminded me, though, of when this exact same thing happened a few years back, with the 2009 series Fanboy and Chum Chum. Dude, wanna feel old? This show is closer to the release of Jimmy Neutron's test animation Runaway Rocket Boy than it is to the current year. That That is just terrible to think about. This series was the bane of many Nickelodeon fans' existence back when it came out. They were pushing for this to be the next big thing for ages. The new Spongebob or Fairly Odd Parents. And when it finally released, most agreed it was just... just not very good. But in recent times, we've been seeing a lot more people come out and say they actually think Fanboy and Chum Chum was underrated. That it got a bad rap and is in fact pretty funny and wasn't allowed to get the chance it deserved. But is this true though? Well, I guess there's only one way to find out. So let's take a look through Fanboy and Chum Chum to see why it was so heated and if it is deserving of this current underappreciated status it has nowadays. Fanboy and Chum Chum was created by one Eric Robles who up until this opportunity arose had only a small hand in working on other cartoons for Cartoon Network, Disney, DreamWorks, among others. But he was given the chance to create a show for Nickelodeon, which resulted in the 2009 premiere of Fanboy and Chum Chum. It was not received well. The series features the titular duo staying atop their bizarre water tower home and their equally bizarre town of Galaxy Hills. Really, it's hard to give this show any kind of proper synopsis that goes beyond a line or two. It's very similar to something like Spongebob in that anything can happen. I will say, however, it confused the fuck out of me as a kid that we never actually get some context as to who or why these two random friends are living together in an abandoned building. Where are their parents? Maybe some questions are better left unanswered. <laughs> Another thing that rarely ever comes into play here are their superhero outfits that never take off. They really like this one superhero, Men Arctica, which is supposed to explain it, I guess, but he doesn't even show up until 42 episodes into the series, so a lot of the setup for the show just goes unexplained. Not that it matters, really. If you're looking for a compelling story, then this is quite possibly the last place you'd want to look. But I do find it to be a strange choice to have your character designed and named to be some kind of comic book fanatic, but then never never really elaborate on it, it's mainly just there to be a silly design. Dude, this show goes off the fucking walls at certain points. Like, you think the whole point would be these two weird kids in a normal world, but no, they are arguably some of the more normal characters here. That's relative though, they're still fucking batshit crazy. Most of the plots just revolve around them being as annoying and destructive as possible. The easiest thing I could compare it to would be those middle seasons of Spongebob. So many episodes just revolve around them blissfully annoying some random secondary character until they want to blow their brains out. Which their voices definitely don't help with. Fanboys is fine as long as he's not screeching at the top of his lungs, which is very frequent. And this is my fault, I'm aware, but I cannot hear Chum Chum without immediately thinking of Styx the Badger from Sonic Boom. She is doing the exact same voice. For the last time, it's not actual gum. It's just how we pick who's it in Freeze Tag. Last processing technology. Those are just phony baloney buzzwords to fool the simple-minded. Because the series is CGI, it means they're probably very limited on the amount of new characters they're budgeted to model. And so they frequently have to make do out of the same five or six secondary characters over and over again. The new kid in school who was transferred after being expelled from his wizarding academy. Oh yeah, he's a wizard. He's basically just treated as the Squidward of the series, being at the brunt of a lot of fanboy and chum chum's antics, which does not get old, I will assure you. It has that exact same Spongebob issue where they go so far with it that you end up sympathizing for him more than our main characters. The only other thing worth noting about him is that he's voiced by none other than Jamie Kennedy, star of the hit film Son of the Mask. I got to see him live with Kellen Goff a few months back, and it was a travesty. He kept grabbing his dick during his set and yelling at the audience who were continuously making fun of him, and getting uncomfortable every time he tried to shout back by bragging about how much money he makes. Cool guy. What kind of influence has Fanboy and Chum Chum had on us as the voices of Kyle and Oz? Uh,
Then there's the fat comic book nerd Oz. He's pretty much just comic book guy from The Simpsons. And then there's a few others like the employees at their local convenience store, Lenny and Boog. Boog is definitely one of the highlights of the show. I don't know who thought this guy should have a John Travolta voice, but it works surprisingly well. He likes to bop things. I am gonna bop you inside out! I don't really find any of the characters here all too memorable, personality or design-wise, other than Fanboy and Chum Chum themselves. It really just feels like whatever characters the writers liked from other media would just be taken, put in their show, and give it a silly enough name so they can excuse it under parody law. Like when so many characters in your show are just references to other media, it really causes your thing to not stand out as a result. Like this sentient arcade machine that's just an Arnold Schwarzenegger ripoff. Or the superhero that inspired the boys to don these outfits in the first place, Manarctica, who's just a parody of Adam West's Batman. That's original. Or the school janitor, General Poopatine. This is the underrated classic? I'm being harsh, but really, I think most of these issues are only really present in the first half of season one. I can for sure see why so many people were quick to write the show off, because it starts bad. Like, the first episode is just them introducing the new boy Kyle, followed by 11 minutes of fanboy and Chum Chum bothering him for not really doing anything other than being a bit snobbish. It's super slow PS2. I think there were only like three scenes in this entire episode. He spanned like four minutes in the classroom, four in the cafeteria, and then like three outside. Episode over. Because of this lack of variety, it causes the scenes to drag on and on when I think the series works best when they're playing into its fast PS comedy. There are quite a few episodes here I didn't think were all that bad. They had super simple premises and didn't do a whole lot with them, but because it's just so quick, I feel like I'm along for the ride, just enjoying the visuals. Like when the kids all play a game of freeze tag with the aforementioned superhero, with him chasing darn fanboy and chum chum to literally freeze them, as they have to sprint around the entire time looking for help until the entire place is all desolate and frozen over. Then there are times when an episode has a good setup and story, but you can feel them just stop caring by the end, rushing towards a conclusion. I really liked the idea behind one of the episodes where they go to the store, buy and subsequently drink a couple frosty freezy freezes. That's what gives them the... Did I mention how obnoxious the theme song is? Anyways, they drink them, but before getting to pay, they spend their only dollar on an arcade machine. And so now they have to figure out a way to get a dollar to pay for their drinks without being able to leave the store. That's a fun idea, putting these wacky characters in such a mundane situation. But in the last minute, I guess they realized they were running out of time, and so said Arnold Schwarzenegger arcade machine shows up, says that fanboy built him in the future and sent him back to pay for their drinks. All's well, well that ends well, well, I right? guess. It really just feels like the writers treat every episode as a blank slate, writing in whatever assets they know they have laying around. Makes sense production-wise, but when it came to watching the show as a kid, I was always left scratching my head at certain choices. For example, there's this episode in Season 2 where Man Arctica comes over, but for whatever reason, Fanboy and Chum Chum don't recognize him, so we spend the entire episode with him trying to convince the two that he's the real superhero they love so much. The biggest issue here is, of course, they've met him before multiple times. In any other show, you could have just written a different superhero for them not to recognize, but because that results in a whole new character needing to be designed, modeled, and rigged, it just makes more sense for them to use the one superhero character they already have, and hope people don't care about this weird lack of continuity. But I guess look at me, sitting here talking about the continuity of Fanboy and Chum Chum, so I suppose I'm the loser here, aren't I? Like I was saying before though, after that rough patch in Season 1, it really does start to pick up in quality. Not drastically or anything, but you can feel the writers starting to get into their groove when working with these characters. They've really made their own little world here and are confident to just throw in side characters randomly for a joke or two, like their own little Springfield in a way. The show works better, in my opinion, when there are loads of different characters at play. Because Fanboy and Chum Chum are so one-note and, honestly, interchangeable with each other, it makes episodes where it's just the two of them bumming around their empty house rather uninteresting. But when you put them in this quirky little world, I do think it becomes more entertaining. One thing I certainly have to praise the show for are the visuals. For 2009, I think the staff working on this series deserve major props for the animation and design. Props which they were given, by the way. Got five Emmys, a lot of which were for the animation itself. I mean, just look at something like Planet Sheen, which somehow released after Fanboy and Chum Chum. Comparatively, it looks way more ugly and stiff, while Fanboy, still being ugly, definitely feels more intentional. 
while the more technical aspects of its visuals are really a marvel to look at for the time. It was the first time as a kid where I was watching a CGI cartoon and was blown away at how well it was able to match the same principles used in 2D, with exaggerated posing and expressions. You can really see the animators trying to get as close to the 2D concept art and storyboards as possible. When I was younger, I always loved seeing the title cards for new episodes, as I find it really neat getting to see the characters in 2D. But honestly, looking at it now without my strange 8-year-old stigma against CGI animation, I think I prefer the way the show looks in 3D better. The backgrounds especially. Feeling like a direct translation of old UPA backgrounds in a three-dimensional space. Many just being simple basic shapes with the textures doing a lot of the heavy lifting, relying on only a few colors each. Many of the backgrounds just being 2D images in general. Being a CGI series, you can feel how limited the writers are and what material they can work with. I think that is why so many episodes are just fanboy and chum chum finding stuff to do around their highs. But every now and then, they push it to an extreme that you can tell they're receiving all their budget for. Like the final episode where most of the characters had to be given entirely new rigs to fit the superhero gimmick they were going for. You're so used to seeing the same 8 characters in 4 locations, that when you spot something new it's like a nice little treat, you know? LS Mark, this is your official warning from the only lasting fanboy and chum chum fan. Riddle me this, would a bad show make this clip? I love the smell of cream pies in the face in the morning. I think the way cartoons were discussed in the early 2010s have had a major ripple effect in the way we talk about them now. I mean, how many times in this series have I shown years old footage of folks talking about these shows like they just shot their dog? That's all there is to say for this rant on fanboy and chum chum. Fanboy and Cum Cum, whatever one wants to call it, there's like two more names that one can come up for this show. People were so vitriolic towards any new series that came out, that was just trying to be dumb and stupid fun, mainly after the rise of such shows as Adventure Time and Steven Universe. Funny story actually, Nickelodeon, among other shows, had the opportunity to pick up Adventure Time for themselves, but instead chose Fanboy and Chum Chum. A decision most look back on and mock Nick for given how much of a global phenomenon that series eventually became, but I think that we're forgetting Adventure Time's pilot and Adventure Time the show are pretty different. And those changes came along while working under Cartoon Network, who had a wide variety of vastly different series under their belt. Nickelodeon, in contrast, mainly focused on the same thing over and over again. Dumb, wacky comedies with a generally grounded tone. It's not a bad thing, of course. They were just trying to continuously replicate what they thought worked about Spongebob, whereas Cartoon Network were always trying something new. Which saw an equal amount of failures, by the way. So not only did Fanboy and Chum Chum from the pilot fit more in line with the other shows Nick were airing at the time, not only had the visual edge with its impressive CGI animation that was sure to stand out, but an Adventure Time produced by Nickelodeon probably wouldn't have looked like this. They probably would have given notes that morphed it into something else entirely. So I don't think it's entirely fair to see Nick's decision to go with Fanboy as some unfounded choice that made no sense. It completely did. Nick just did what Nick did best. Ran it for two seasons, saw it was only a modest success, and cancelled it. But because of the way people treated Fanboy when it came out, ranting and raving at Heights another example of Nickelodeon's fallen empire, calling it one of the worstest and most baddestest cartoons ever, it resulted in others blindly believing it for years, many of which didn't even watch the show. Only for the kids who actually grew up with it to become old enough to voice their own opinions, sharing clips they find funny. And so now, the show is considered some underrated gem all of a sudden. It's a cycle we're never gonna break out of, it's just the way things work. I'm sure there are some hardcore robot and monster fans out there, but I think they like to keep that to themselves out of fear of being publicly tarred and feathered. It's fine to not deal in absolutes. It's okay to say that a series was just... okay. Fanboy and Chum Chum's resurgence really reminded me of Modern Family Guy, where it's bashed for so long that folks who actually like it start sharing cherry-picked clips that showcase a good joke here and there. So then other people who only know about the series from those cherry-picked clips just assume, Wow, this show must have actually been hilarious based off these two clips. Underrated. But then when you actually go to watch the episode of Family Guy that clip came from, you find out about all the nothing that happens in between. All the boring parts, all the jokes that don't land, all the bare bones characters. I really feel like Fanboy and Chum Chum is the same way. Sure it has a lot of funny parts, but hey, a broken clock is right twice a day. <sighs> we have to help him. Are you crazy? He didn't help you when you were under that bus that he was driving. Either way, just from watching it you can tell the crew working on this series had a lot of fun, trying to insert everything they liked into it too. And I can appreciate the amount of creative freedom it appears they gave themselves. Doesn't mean I have to like it though. So why was Fanboy and Chum Chum so hated? Well probably because it's not very good.
That's it, go home. Once again, I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Squarespace gives folks a powerful online platform to create your own website, connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members-only content, manage your members, send emails, and leverage audience insights, all in one easy-to-use platform. There's even a fully integrated comment system that supports comments, threads, and likes. Or check out the Squarespace extensions, third-party tools to help you manage inventory, promote products, streamline bookkeeping, reconcile and file sales tax, and ship items across the globe as well as letting you display posts from your own social media profiles. Why wouldn't you want to use Squarespace? So go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash lsmark to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And thanks Squarespace for sponsoring this video.